Title of my message today is William Ellery Channing and the Emergence of Unitarianism in America. This is the third in my series of Unitarian Universalists who have made a difference. I've talked to you already about Hosea Ballou and Universalism. I talked to you about uh, um, the woman that gave all the money and uh, her name is Veach, Caroline Veach. Talked about her last time. And today I'm sharing with you about William Ellery Channing. He was born April 7th, 1780 in Newport, Rhode Island. Now it was said of Newport that it was uh, one of the wealthiest cities in colonial America. For most of the 18th century, it was home to a booming commercial economy and a vibrant, free-thinking intellectual community. And that is where William Ellery Channing was born. He was born in a wealthy, prominent community, and he was born to a prosperous and distinguished family. His grandfather was William Ellery. That was his maternal grandfather. He, he was actually a signer of the Declaration of Independence. His parents were William. Uh, his father, William, was a Rhode Island attorney and a uh, Rhode Island Attorney General, rather, and a United States District Attorney, very prominent. And his mother was Lucy Ellery Channing, also, of course, from that very prominent Ellery family. His brother, Walter Channing, became Boston's leading obstetrician. He was the first professor of midwifery at Harvard Medical School and the first American physician to advocate the use of anesthesia in childbirth. So a lot of people were thankful for him. <laughs> and then he had another brother. Brother Edward Channing was a professor of rhetoric at Harvard. So you can see already the difference. I tell you some differences between the Baloos and the Channings and the way they were raised. And you can see this difference in what I've expressed to you already. Some early influences. Now, I got this from uh, this first part. Let me read it first. Slaves of the Channing family households were leaders in the African community. Duchess Quamino, William's black nanny, and Newport Gardner, owned by an uncle, taught him that integrity is the essence of religion. I got that from a bio on the internet, but I could not find anything from Channing's writings where he referred to these folks. And indeed, uh, well, he didn't refer to his family either. I, you know, he, he was not someone that talked of what went on in his personal life. That was not the kind of preaching that he did. Um, but indeed, I looked in other places, and his family did own slaves. They did have this, uh, Duchess Quamino was a slave in the household, and this uncle had this other slave, and these were very prominent uh, Africans. They did uh, both become very prominent in other ways. It says here that, what, that uh, Duchess Quamino was a black nanny. It was William's black nanny is the way it referred to it. But what I found was she was a prominent cook. She was, uh, and actually became very famous as a pastry chef. She later um, uh, was able to uh, have a little bit of a business and sold her pastries, made enough money doing that that she paid for her own freedom and became a free person and was well known as an outstanding pastry chef. I'm wondering, this is just me wondering, because Channing said he knew nothing of slavery until he was grown and went to Virginia to work. I'm wondering if he didn't realize that his family owned slaved, slaves. I mean, he may not have understood that uh, initially, and she did become a free woman, and uh, so I, I don't know. But I, I feel like that maybe one of the biographers wanted to acknowledge at least, this is an acknowledgement that his family did own slaves. Um, and whether or not they were influential, I don't know. Channing once said that he owed to the Reverend Ezra Stiles, who was the president of Yale, the indignation he felt at every invasion of human rights. So that was an early influence. And Samuel Hopkins was his childhood minister. Channing described Hopkins' harsh theology as stern and appalling, yet he never forgot that it was Hopkins who brought slavery to his attention when he was 12. So that kind of shows you that that's when it came to his attention when he was 12 years old. Uh, Channing was a sharp lad. He entered Harvard in 1794. 
If you do your arithmetic, you see he was 14 years old when he entered Harvard. Okay. Now, this is what he said about it. Here's the youngest picture I could find of him. He said, college was never in a worse state than when I entered it. Society was passing through a most critical stage. The French Revolution had diseased the imagination and unsettled the understanding of men everywhere. The old foundations of social order, loyalty, tradition, habit, reverence for antiquity were everywhere shaken, if not subverted. So it was sort of negative about these changes initially. And actually, while he was in college, he sort of went back to some of his earlier beliefs. He sort of uh, followed the revivalists, but then he changed his mind again. Here were, this was his collegiate reading list, some of the folks he read about. Actually, his man's spiritual nature and social relations became very prominent in his interests, and his reading diet consisted of authors such as Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Priestley, and Richard Price. Now, I wasn't that familiar with Richard Price, but Channing credited Price's dissertations for permanently molding his philosophy and, from what he said, saved him from John Locke. <laughs> So John Locke was there with this idea, as many of you remember, the blank slate, you know, and uh, Richard Price was said, no, we come with some kinds of things that are a part of our basic nature. So Price saved him from John Locke. The doctrine of innate ideas is what this was. And Price instilled in him that doctrine that we had innate ideas. And after studying Price, Channing began to write words like love, and words like right with capital letters, even if they were in the middle of a sentence. So he elevated these concepts to something that we might think of as divine, like you always capital God. So he capital these kinds of concepts, he capitalized. He would later elevate these ideas above the Bible itself. Okay. After graduation, for two years, he went and worked as a tutor to a wealthy Virginia family on a plantation. Now, this is when he really got to know about slavery. He didn't stay there for two years. He came back home because, for one reason, here's a quote from him. There is one object here which always depresses me, and it is slavery. This alone would prevent me from ever settling in Virginia. Language cannot express my detestation of it. Master and slave, nature never made such a distinction or established such a relation. So after two years of living in Virginia, he left partly because of this and partly because he was not well. He uh, continued his theological studies from home. In um, December of 1801, he returned to Harvard after being named as a Harvard regent. Now, like we have our regents that share with us what you all have to do. Like right now, the regents have said that you must, that Georgia Southern and Armstrong are going to merge. He became a regent of Harvard. And that gave him enough, enough, they, they gave him a little money to go with that, and so he could continue his doctoral studies, and he became Dr. William Ellery Channing. He was uh, later then ordained at the Boston's Federal Street Church in 1803, and he remained at that church the rest of his ministry. That was his church, 1803. Now, he came to ministry during a time which is known as the Unitarian Controversy. The Unitarian Controversy wasn't something that was just two or three years. It actually was a, a longer period of time, and it was pretty complex. Uh, and we had to do a lot of studying of this in seminary about what the Unitarian Controversy was. So I'm just going to share some bullet points with you to summarize it and sort of simplify it. What was the Unitarian controversy? By the end of the 18th century, many of the churches of the standing order, these were the churches in New England that the Puritans established when they came over from England, many of the churches of the standing order had become much more liberal in their theology, where their folks were becoming well-educated, they were reading things like he was reading, and they were becoming more liberal. They were more liberal than their Puritan ancestors who were Calvinist. And as you may remember me talking about the Calvinists before, the Calvinists uh, were people who believed in predestination and election of the saved, those kinds of things, and were very, very strict about their theology. Emboldened by the Second Great Awakening, 
That was a revival. Some Orthodox churches began to insert creedal elements into their covenants. When the pilgrims first came and the Puritans, they didn't have creeds necessarily. But then after that revival, they said, we need to state firmly what it is that we believe. And they began, uh, while the liberal churches clung ever more strongly to the old Puritan idea that we're going to walk together in Christian love and just leave it more generic without the entailments of creedal stipulations. So the conservative churches became more narrow in their creed. The liberal churches did not. The crisis came to a head in 1805. Now, what year did I say that Channing was ordained? Oh, that's so good, 1803. That's because you don't have your cell phones out buzzing and interrupting you. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> he was ordained in 1803. The crisis came to head just a couple years later, 1805. After going unfulfilled for a period of time, Harvard named Henry Ware, who was a liberal, as the Hollis Chair of Divinity. Henry Ware. If you've heard the Ware Lecture, those of you that go to UU things, this was the guy it was named after. Henry Ware was a liberal, and this chair had been contested by both the conservative and the liberals. Both of them wanted their person in that important chair. Harvard finally decided to put Henry Ware in there. Well, after that happened, the Calvinists, the more conservative group, got very upset, of course. They withdrew from Harvard and founded the Andover Newton Theological School, which was a prominent theological school until very recently when it closed. Um, very prominent. They're in Boston. Actually, many of our Unitarian Universalist ministers were trained at Andover Newton. It later combined with another, but it was a very prominent theological school. The controversy continued. So it wasn't just even after that, okay, it's over now, the Harvard chair, the Hollis chair, it continued, even down to each of the individual churches. Many of them had controversies within them because they would have people within them, as you can imagine, more conservative, more liberal. Which way are we going to go? and then they very often split. Here's an example, a prominent example of something like this. This is a plaque, and this plaque is on the church in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It says, the church of Scrooby Layden and the Mayflower gathered on this hillside in 1620 has ever since preserved unbroken records and maintained a continuous ministry. You remember studying your hill pilgrims they came and got on Plymouth Rock? Okay, they're saying they were, they were here and we've continued that. This is the church, its first covenant being still the basis of its fellowship and reverent memory of its pilgrim founders. This fifth meeting house, they, they, they would rebuild the meeting house. It would burn down or something. They'd rebuild it. Or, and this one was erected in 1897. And they put up this plaque saying, we are the, we're still carrying it on from the very beginning. This is us. That's what they were saying. Now, down the street, you see a church with this on a UCC church, United Church of Christ. It says, this tablet is inscribed in grateful memory of the pilgrims and of their successors who at the time of the Unitarian controversy in 1801 adhered to the belief of the fathers. This, we, we, these are the ones that adhered to the basic belief. And on the basis of the original creed and covenant perpetuated at the great sacrifice in the church of the pilgrim of the evangelical faith and fellowship of the church of Scrooby Layden and the Mayflower organized in England, they're saying we are the real descendants, okay, of the pilgrims. Both of them claiming. In, church, in the states where we have two churches, we have that both claim to be one is the uh, original first African Baptist church and the other is the historical First African Baptist Church. It's a similar kind of thing, you know, we're claiming, okay, we're, we're the historical, we're the original. So others have done this throughout time too. Well, all of the churches, if you go to New England, you'll see one church in the middle of town, and sometimes that's a Unitarian church, and sometimes it's a UCC church. And then right next door or across the street or down the street will be the other one, because many times they split, very often. And sometimes it even went to court, and the courts had to decide who gets the church, who gets the furnishings. When the folks left at this church, they took, they took all the silverware and all the furnish, a lot of the stuff with them. We had somebody from our church that left and took the chalice one time, I think. You know, people do that kind of thing. <laughs> so this is where they took all the stuff and it went to court. Well, the courts decided, many of the courts decided in favor of the Unitarians because the Unitarians had more members of the whole parish. The whole parish got to vote all the men of the parish even though many of them didn't go to church. Now, the active church members also included men and women, and they usually were more conservative. 
but they lost it. So what they ended up saying, many of the uh, congregationists who later became what is now UCC, they said, well, they got the furniture and we got the faith. That's kind of the way they looked at it, you know. Actually, the Unitarian uh, Church of the, uh, that was Freudian, the uh, <laughs> United Church of Christ, we call them our cousins. We don't have many in the South. I think there's one in Atlanta. There's one in Midway where the pilgrims came down. Most of them are in the Northeast, so they and, and other places. Uh, UCC is what they go by. We call them our cousins because we're related to them, both descended from the Puritans. They've now also become very liberal. And in seminary, they would come over to Meadville Lombard, where I was, and take a lot of classes with us, just as we went to their seminaries. We called them UCC, Unitarians Considering Christ. <laughs> so, because that's where they kind of are now. But here is a fellow that uh, if you are having to go as a minister, going before the Ministerial Fellowship Committee, you have to know who Jared Sparks is. Now, Jared Sparks, actually, we probably should know who he was, maybe because he was president of Harvard at one time and other things, probably a very prominent minister, but that's not why we know his name. This is a young Jared uh, Sparks, and the reason we know his name is because it was at his ordination that William Ellery Channing gave his most famous sermon. So where did the most famous sermon, the Baltimore sermon in Baltimore, Maryland, come from that William Ellery Channing described what Unitarians were? It was at the ordination of Jared Sparks. The sermon was called Unitarian Christianity. Now, if you want to read the whole sermon, I have it here in this little booklet. It was quite long. This was a sermon. And uh, this was the reason it was so outstanding and the reason it was so prominent was before then, a lot, many of the Unitarians, including Channing, were not necessarily too happy about the Unitarian name being what they were called. That was really sort of put upon them by folks, other folks saying, oh, you're just a bunch of Unitarians, like the people over in uh, England and, and Europe uh, is what you are. And they said, no, we're, we're Christians. We're the real Christians, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So they argued about it. But finally... William Ellery Channing claimed it, and this is when he claimed it. He shared this sermon at the ordination of Jared Spirits in Baltimore and called the Baltimore sermon and said, we are Unitarian Christians, and here is who we are. Now, it's quite lengthy, and it gets into a lot of things, but I'm, just, again, going to share bullet points just to highlight this for you. First, he established reason as valid and necessary for the interpretation of Scripture. Reason. He said, our leading principle in interpreting scripture is this, that the Bible is a book written for men in the language of men, and that its meaning is to be sought in the same manner as that of other books. With these views of the Bible, we feel it our bounden duty to exercise our reason upon it perpetually, to compare, to infer, to look beyond the letter of the Spirit. That was pretty controversial, and some people would still have that controversial, right? This morning, on my Facebook feed, uh, one of our friends who sometimes visits here, Michael Nielsen, said, here's your ancient wisdom of the day, and he had it, a verse up there, and I said, oh, I think I'll work that into the sermon, so I am. Here it is. This is from the Bible, from Deuteronomy 25, verses 11 and 12. If men get into a fight with one another and the wife of one intervenes to rescue her husband from the grip of his opponent by reaching out and seizing his genitals, <laughs> you shall cut off her hand, showing no pity. <laughs> so the reason I'm reading that for this is now Channing would say we are to use our reason about that and say, no, we do not cut off her hand. You have to use some reason when you read the Bible. All right, that's what that's about. Now, the second task is to lay out five reason-based conclusions of Unitarian Christians. Here's what the reason-based conclusions are. This is what Unitarians sort of believe. One is that God is one, that being the Father and Creator. The Trinity is a false doctrine. That's what they were saying. God is one. Jesus does not have two natures. You know, sometimes in some of our Sunday school classes that you may have learned, gone to, you heard that the human Jesus suffered, but the Christ didn't, or this was one nature of Jesus. Jesus had two natures. They said, no, Jesus does not have two natures, human and divine, but is fully human. He is God's son, but not God. 
Three, God is morally perfect. Therefore, could not choose for some to be elected to damnation. He's agreeing with Bellew here. Four, Unitarians did not consider Christ and his death as a blood atonement for human sin. We didn't have to have a sacrifice of blood to be saved. Again, that's very, the very same thing that Ballou was saying. And five, Christian virtue had at its foundation in the moral nature and conscience of humans. Our moral nature and conscience is where Christian virtue has as its foundation. It's defined by love of God, love of Christ, and moral living. Those were the five conclusions, he said, of Unitarian Christians. Now, and indeed what he was doing was mapping out, this is generally what Unitarian Christians believe. It didn't last long. <laughs> Transcendentalists came along and said, well, it's not just reason, it's also intuition. The humanists came along and said, well, some of us maybe not believe in God. You know, so it... Others came along with different ideas, but at least at this point in time, he laid it out and said, yes, we are different from our cousins over here in these other churches, and here is who we are. After he did that, he formed a group of ministers that agreed and were the more liberal ministers. They had a, a society they formed, and then in May 26 of 1825, they officially formed the founding of the American Unitarian Association and we became what many referred to as a formal denomination then, the American Unitarian Association. Here are some famous quotes from Channing, William Ellery Channing. I'll share these with you. He said, it is chiefly through books that we enjoy intercourse with superior minds. In the best books, great men talk to us, give us their most precious thoughts, and pour their souls into ours. Now, as I'm looking here, probably more than half the people sitting here are women, and you may say, why is all this about the men? Now, I, William Ellery Channing was a great man of his time, but if you read his stuff, you really realize, okay, he's a sexist, he's a classist, he's a racist, too, you know. He is, if you read, this, read his things, these are all there, but he was significant and progressive in his time in the things, some of the things he did. Not as progressive as some of his time, though, by the way but he was a very outstanding person that gave us lots of inspiration. So I didn't change it to all people. I read it just the way he said it. He also said, fix your eyes on perfection and you make almost everything speed toward it. Look for the, what you really want. Set your goal. Everything will speed toward it. And he said, difficulties are meant to rouse, not discourage. That's a good one for us to think about in today's time. The human spirit is to grow strong by conflict. And the last thing he said is, nothing which has entered into our experience is ever lost. Nothing which has entered into our experience is ever lost. Well, he died. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just saying it that way. That's the way it was said. This is, this is, this is the book... Uh, Henry Whitney Bellows preached his sermon at his memorial service, okay? And this is the way he starts that sermon. A calamity has befallen our faith, our country, the church, and the world. William Ellery Channing is dead. To those among us who knew him, little that is affecting or suggestive can be said after the bare announcement that he is gone. And throughout the rest of his sermon... He talks about what he, do, he does and what he lifted up, how he inspired us. And then he goes back, but he is dead. And then he'll talk about some more. And he says, but he is dead. But he is dead <laughs> over and over again. And indeed, he is dead. William Ellery Channing is dead. There's the bell that knocks it off. There's the guy, William Bellows, that said this. But here's one more quote that I'll give you because he says, William, he said, if we, whatever we read, you know, becomes a part of us, right? And lives with us. So here's another quote from him. He said, there is one word that covers every cause to which Channing devoted his talents and his heart. And that word is freedom. Free the slave, free the serf, free the ignorant, free the sinful. Free agency is the prime distinction and privilege of humanity. Extinguish freedom and you extinguish humanity. His whole religious teachings are directed towards 
men, freeing men from servitude to their passions and appetites and impulses. He would make every soul master of itself. Freedom. William Ellery Channing was a Unitarian Universalist who made a difference, a huge difference. He's the person who proclaimed our faith and prevalent theology as a separate denomination. We can look to him for that. But as William, as Bellow said, Henry Bellow said, he is dead. Yet he still makes a difference. He still makes a difference. We are still inspired by his words. We are still inspired by that which he, which he lifted up, which is love with a capital L. And we do lift that up in this congregation and other congregations every Sunday. And hopefully we let that guide us in our lives. May it be so.